Guess who it is today? It's uh, the incredible Steve Valentine, magician, actor, uh, father, mother, brother, sister, friend, uh, incredibly talented person on location in Vancouver doing some weird uh, movie. Pro I think he's a vampire. Let's find out. Here he is. Incredible. Uh, add him to the right. Steve Valentine, thank you for doing this. Hello, Dave. How are you? It's good hey, to meet you. Hey, here, good buddy. Man. Thanks for having good me on, buddy. Your, on your show. I'm it's a, I don't even know what this is. This is, I've been just talking. I don't need, I'm not an interviewer. You've, you've probably had more interviews, done more interviews than I've done. You know what I mean? In your career. I'm, I'm, I don't yeah, but you know, know what, what I'm doing. I think, this is a chat a, between, a you know what I consider yeah, this? Chat, this is like, think, this is locker room talk backstage at the Magic Castle. You know, when we go into each other's dressing room and go, what's this? this who is, who gave you that? Did Bob, is, did Bob Reed show you this? Room. Remember that thing that Ali Bongo did? And, <laughs> can we, I feel like Eric Morecambe, like, can we say Ali Bongo? Can we, can we <laughs> can say we? it? Can we? No, <laughs> Ali Bongo. You were close. You just said it. Oh. I was watching, there's a, a brilliant bit of uh, video on YouTube, which is uh, more common wise. I don't know if they ever played in America as they well. They didn't, but I became hooked on them through my Brit friends. Yeah. I mean, I they're just, the, as a team, it's beautiful. But there's a bit of video that I just found on YouTube that is a live performance of them doing their live act in Croydon in England. And it's, um, uh, and it's fantastic. And you just see how they... How they start the show, how they hook the audience, how they oh, keep Oh, that's great. Hooked, I would love to. How they see, when you see people like that, it's one thing to see them on television where it's overproduced. Yeah. But to see them live, to see the transitions and how they, you know, that's, that's instructive. And, and there's, a, there's, there's a 15 to 20 minute ventriloquist dummy bit where he's, no, he's not even doing ventriloquism between the two of them. That is one of the greatest. Like you could tell that this was the, this was the core part of their act back in the day is what it felt like. You know, right, when right. They were, when, when they were beginning, like that was yeah. the bit that they did. And it's just so funny. And, and he comes out in the beginning and he says, uh, Ernie says, uh, oh, it's a bit of a fracas backstage. And he goes, I beg your pardon? You know, a bit of a fracas. And he does the bit where he looks up stage and he goes, can we say fracas? <laughs> no, fracas. No, you were close. <laughs> and, and then when you look back at the TV shows, he does the same joke over and over again. And it's like, That's it's so this funny. repeat gag, but you just love it. Yeah, oh, yeah. follows them through their career, right? Well, that's the thing when you're on location is that you get a lot of time to yourself. So I start watching all these things. You have good Wi-Fi. That's do. important, I would think, but in your dressing room. Wi-Fi, right? That's yes. Key. Yeah, <laughs> it's super key. And uh, so I watch a lot of Eric and Ernie right now. I'm kind of on a more common wise kick. So where are you now? Are you on set at a, uh, at a studio? I'm, right now I'm in the hotel. No, right now with day off, I'm in the hotel. I've got... Uh, um, I'm just kind of here in Vancouver right now. I'm doing a movie called Monster High. I should show you. I got I just got the teeth got delivered. Can we see? This. Yeah, yeah. So this is. I got these molded. Um, nice. They I mold them to your teeth. To me. Yeah, because you have to learn to speak. Did they them. send you the mold and you bit it and sent it back, or did you go somewhere in no, Toronto? No, you go to a special effects shop and then they and then they do it and it's really nasty and they they pack your mouth full of silicone. Yeah. Let's go. Uh -huh. Oh, look how good that looks. That looks fantastic. Yeah. Isn't that great? So yeah. So they clip in at the back, and you've got... Uh, so I went you... down to uh, the coffee shop this morning, and I was like, can I get some more caffeine, please? <laughs> 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 uh, these, are, these are so good. So I got them delivered because I have to learn to speak with them clearly. Yes. Before I start to... What's the secret to that? I don't know. It's all, almost like a Brando I, in the... No, it's like... Yeah, it's like uh, marbles in the mouth. You know, you have yeah. to speak around it. And yeah. They have to speak around it in some way. And then if it doesn't work, they'll... Uh, ah. They'll voice... Uh, they'll do, it. It. do the voiceover after, afterwards, right? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Which happened to me once after I learned to speak with a set of teeth. And then they said... Is that the, do, so that's not the first time you've uh, uh, acted with prosthetic teeth? No, I've done a, a fair bit with prosthetic teeth. Really? It's all, part of being, it's all part of being English. <laughs> yeah, but you have fantastic teeth. You have better teeth than most Americans. I, I bought them in America. Oh, okay, I was uh, going to say. These, yeah, these, um, no, I did, I did a movie called Don't Look Under the Bed years ago for, for Disney, and we had upper and lower teeth. Yeah. And so I spent hours a day learning to enunciate, and then at the end of it, they said, after we filmed everything, 
They're like, we're going to double your dialogue because we can hear the fan in the background the whole time. So it had nothing to do with the tea. Great. Somebody left the fan nothing on. To do with the tea. Yeah, yeah. But well, there you go. It's all good stuff. It's, it's Monster high. Magic, Monster, Monster high. Monster high. So yeah, it's based on, there's a, a series, Mattel has these toys and then I, there's an animated series, which is a massive fan base. And so now they're doing the live action movie. Oh, and, that's awesome. I mean, I, I play Dracula, I'm the dad, but the, the stars are really the kids and they're, yeah. Man, they're singing boys. Where do they get music. these kids? Like, you know, that some of them come from Hollywood. other kid projects, that are like uh, Beyond something or other, um, uh, like Netflix and Disney series and Nickelodeon yeah, yeah, series. Yeah. And then they'll have open auditions as well. That's a great thing, you know. So these kids range from about 14 to 19. Uh-huh. And their singing voices are, are ridiculous. So the Amazing. music is very, the music is very kind of like Billie Eilish. It's very now. Uh, and it's very yeah. very good. So, yeah. I'm, are uh, you a are you a singer, yeah. Steve? Did you ever train? I know, you know, I'm not. And and I've actually started taking singing lessons because I keep really? playing rock stars. And every time I every time like we love we love your performance as the rock star. Can we hear you sing? Because you know that. And then I'm like, well, I've got I'm okay. I just don't have like an '80s rock voice. And, yeah. I, and I'm so used to the producers going like this. Yeah. Well, we'll dub you. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll find a singing Aww. voice. So, you, so I've uh, yeah, I'm in the middle of uh, singing practice, which is trying to erase fifty years of bad habits. Yeah. You know, when you started doing regular 1903, did you find it? How did really you know? Messed up your How did you voice? know that? Because well, because you're the master of ceremonies. You're the ringleader, and you're always like, you know, I, I know I did a commercial as a ringleader for Subway once, and I was yeah. the. the and I remember just being like, ladies and gentlemen. And before yeah. I knew it, like, yeah. my voice was complete. Well, crazy. they call it, uh, I mean, I got, yeah. I, I mean, I, I blew my voice out in the first couple of weeks uh, in Australia when we were touring it, you know, previews yeah. and all that. Because I don't have any training. I don't know what I'm doing. I was like, oh, I'm stage. I need to be louder than I normally am. It's like, well, you have a microphone, David. You know, you don't know that, but you do. You're in- and uh, right. and I have no training I, you know, it, it, from the diaphragm. Do it from here. I don't know what that means. That's yeah. like saying do a double lift with your toes. I, you speak to me in a language I understand. Bre- yeah. Speak from your diaphragm. Uh, that, that, that doesn't help. Yes. What is so? What did you do? How, did you just get used to it, or did you? Yeah, take some I I suffered through it. I, my voice got more gravelly, and I, I was lozenges and hot tea and lemon and honey and. You know, all the stuff. And then, you know, if you get a little cold or something, then it goes away. I mean, I was there in London a couple years ago when, um, uh, who am I thinking of? Uh, actor, friend of ours in London. Uh, Andy Nyman. Andy Nyman Andy lost Nyman. his voice in the middle of um, Fiddler. Yeah, and that's a, that's a tough part. I mean, and that's, oh, yeah. Did he I lose saw his him. voice? See, and, that's, and Andy's had, think about it though, Andy's had years of training. And yeah. so it, it just happens to the best of them. Yeah. I used to do, I did panto for years in England when I was growing up and there was this one guy that would come in and play the, the, the drag queen part, the widow and, yeah. the, and the, um, and always play widow twanky and Aladdin. <laughs> and, um, he was fully trained, brilliant, but he'd always about halfway through start knocking like gargling with yeah. brandy and lemon or port and lemon. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Because well, his voice. I'm worried to be honest, because it's been a while since I've had to speak, you know, on stage and, uh, and also, uh, you know, it was the physical toll. Uh, I've been sedate for a year and a half. Now, how about you? I did you did I understand you? Did you do a gig recently in Miami? I did a gig recently. In it was Miami. it magic? That was uh, was that yeah, the first yeah, one you've done in a while? It's the first one. It's the first show I've done in two years. And it's funny because I was talking to a friend of mine, and she said, "Like you wait and see." She's like, uh, uh, "The first show back, um, you're so not used to performing on stage. You yeah. really warm up before you go out." So I was like, "Okay, so." Basically, it was, uh, I was asked if I would do this guy's wedding. And um, I was like, I, don't, I haven't done weddings in years, yeah. you know, 10, 12 years since I've done a wedding gig. Uh, but it was like, well, how much do you want? And I was like, oh, okay. Well, in that case. Yeah, uh, that, yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah that kind of wedding. Um, yeah. Weekend in Miami and right. and at the Faina Hotel, which is out on that strip, and yeah. it, which is a stunning place. And so I was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to do it. And it was it was one of those gigs where as soon as I said yes, I was like regretting saying yes because now yeah. I had to put together a 45-minute show for a wedding. And I'm like, what do I, how do I even, and I, I remember I was listening to um, 
a podcast and uh, uh, Bill Malone was talking about how he sets up his shows when he does a gig and his contracts. And he was talking about how, you know, because Bill's really a close-up performer, really, right? So yeah. when he does his close-up shows, he's like, so it has to be this way if people are away. You have to stack the chairs up. And so I said to the, the lovely people who were organizing it, the, the, the father of the groom, who's an amateur magician anyway, so it was kind of, he understood. And so I, I, I was like, look, we have to, I got an image of the dance floor and it was a 24 foot square dance floor and then the floor people of death. Were sitting yeah. at tables. Oh, oh that's where the jokes go to die, yeah. Yeah, they just go, Ooh. Paul yeah. Daniels once said that you can get past it if you just ignore that it's there, And but I, I don't know. Um, so I, I said, we need to bring people onto the, onto the dance floor and we had to get the hotel to agree to, to move put chairs, chairs to, onto the dance and so floor. So we eventually did it. So we got like 30 sure. people on the dance floor. There were still people on the sides um, who had a worse view. And I was supposed to be on a platform, but that was too far back. So I ended up kind of having to make sure everything played from chest and up, right? Because it's cabaret. But I did feel like um, I was worthy of it. I, I wanted to do the challenge because it felt a bit like it, how it used to be back in the days of like Paul Rossini when they were doing. Yeah. The nightclub floors, you know, yes. and that's what yeah. it was. It was those supper club, dance yeah. floors, the supper clubs. And that's, you know, if Rossini was killing it doing everywhere and nowhere and cups and balls in that kind of an environment, then... You know, th this we, is exactly what yeah. I wanted to talk to you about because I heard that you had done this. And so next week, well, tomorrow, I fly to LA for a, a, my mm. first corporate gig at Manhattan Beach in a hotel ballroom for, I don't know, 150, 200 guys. And uh, right. it's been a couple years. Well, no, uh, with all the production shows, it's almost been 10 to 12 years for me doing a ballroom type show as well. And because we get spoiled, uh, corporate on stage, show. Right? yeah, I got spoiled by all the production shows I've been in. I got somebody yeah. doing the lights, got somebody doing the, I don't have any sound cues that I've been right. relying on for the past 12 years. You know, I don't have anything. So right. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm trying to figure out a show well, to put together and what will play for, you know, a hundred people in a ballroom. And I, I don't know what my situation is going to be, to be honest. It's very unnerving, and and um, I, somebody said to me about halfway through, and I started listing. I started putting stuff up on the wall in postcards, you know, like I was writing a script, and I'm like, okay, I want to do this as an opener, and I want to kind of finish with this. But then you just don't know the, the level of well, by the time you go on, the level of drunkenness, the level of um, like for me, it was visibility and sound and the uh, lighting. Yeah, you want to be seen one. and heard, as Billy McComb once yeah. said. Uh, there was a lighting. Mr. McComb, what are your requirements? I want to be seen and heard, my boy. I trust and that's you to it, do your right? job. And so, so I brought my own sound system. You I did. have my own mic and oh, a smart. remote transmitter. But my media star completely crapped out halfway through the oh, show no. because the band had so many, uh, so uh, many other antenna-like um, gadgets on stage. Audio A, like audio A, but it's bulletproof, yeah. military grade. Well, this is what the new one, right? The new yeah, one. That's audio out Ape, yeah, audio A, yeah. Yeah, well, I learned it. I learned the hard way because uh, I, I lost half my audio cues throughout the show. It was all right in the end, but um, I, I. Oh no! Halfway uh, through, you lost it. Oh no! I lost my music. Yeah, and so I just I didn't have the music to play me off. But it was all right. But so the, the so what I ended up doing, and my friend said to me, and I was like, look, I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, and I feel like um, I want to do something very wedding y. I don't know, like com com so. Yeah. All, all the wedding stuff that I planned ended up not being able to be done. Like I thought, okay, there's this great Tenyo, never thought you'd ever hear that out of my mouth. Uh, this great Tenyo torn and restored poster. That's, have you seen this one? Where it's uh -huh. just absolutely delightful. You just have pieces of a poster, like a Disney poster, and it's all bits. Yeah. And then, and then you, you open it up. And it's a bit like the Slidini thing with the pocket, but you open it up and it's restored. And nice. um, you never have to tear anything. And so I was like, I'll make a poster of the bride and groom and then I have things written on the other side of the scraps of paper. So I'm like, I wrote all these notes about what to do in the show. And at the end of it, the real reason we're here is for these two. That was the idea. Oh. But I couldn't get a high enough res image of the Oh, no. The oh. So I couldn't get it done. Plus, it's like, it was like 75 bucks a poster. So I was like, ah. And then, they take all uh, the good, yeah, they take all the good shots at the wedding. Not before yeah, the wedding. The yeah. wedding. <laughs> yeah. And then I thought, uh, I love doing the... Um, the Paul Patassi uh, cards across the one. Have you seen that 1950s black and white footage? It's fantastic. He does it in French. It's on YouTube. I'll send it to you. I did a whole thing on it on magic on the go. Um, basically he has two guys up on stage sitting at his table and instead of going, 
I'm going to pass three cards from here to here. What he does is he says, right, you count off 32, cut them into two equal piles. You put your hands on that pile. I want you to count, uh, count how many you've got. You've got 16. All right, you cover those. If he's got 16, you've got 16, right? Okay. Actually, why don't you just count your cards? You've got 12. How do you have 12? Wait a minute. You, what happened to the other? And you just keep going back and forth. And this person keeps getting less and less. It happens three times in a row. And the situation comedy is fantastic. And this person gets more and more, right, on the other fantastic. side. Fantastic. Until fantastic. they've got... 30 cards and then this guy's got two and it's and it just it's palm and load and palm and load yeah and um i'll send you the video because it's really fantastic so i thought well this is this is ideal for like a wedding because you get a married couple up right and you go so equal everything's equal in this relationship isn't it so you cut the cards yes. and you've got 16 and you've got 16 and what do you mean you've got 12 how many oh you've got the extra four oh that you don't you don't, you don't yeah, 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 yeah. the extra four do you you know and then keep going until she's got 30 and then you know, all the lines about what's hers is yours and what's yours is hers and what well, the rest of it. And then the, the idea is at the end of it, he's got two, she's got 30. And I'm just going, well, you know what you need to do with those two and just wait until he hands them over to her and then, <laughs> and then go, I now pronounce you man and wife. That was the idea of it. Right? So you know, perfect. That was the, right. So I, had two, so I had one group of friends tell me, oh, this is great for a married couple. And then I had another group of friends tell me they thought it was a bit sexist. So yeah, right. Like, exactly. Well, it's old school. Yeah. It's uh, cringy. It's uh, yeah, gender yeah, norm. Uh, yeah. So I, I was like, well, now, how do you, you know. Yeah, like, you what, can't. To me, uh, yeah, it's a shame because I think it's actually a very funny routine. But um, I never got, I didn't do it because I was just concerned about, it coming sure. across as being she's a money grubber, you know, and the, yeah, yeah, so there was. But now I have I had an idea the other day, and I'm like, oh shit, I should have done this, which was really emphasize how it's all about sharing and giving a hundred percent to each other, you know. Well, you're really taking this seriously. He's very generous, isn't he? Yeah, he turn just, around, yeah, turn it into a positive message. You just flip the script, yeah. Flip the script and then do the shirt off, like set up. <laughs> Take the, the shirt the, off his back. back. Take the shirt off his back at the very end. That was uh, so. If I ever do it again, oh uh, my gosh. But, but all the stuff that I worked hard on, like you're saying for this gig, you know, I ended up in the end really kind of just doing the bits that I knew. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I did a new opening. Where better to do a new opening than the first gig back after two years and just thought, oh, screw it. I'll just throw this in. And it, um, it ended up working well because the... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, a double bowl production, like the old school bowl of water production. Wow. Um, but there's this author called Charles Waller, who I don't know if you've ever read any of these books. He's very he's obscure. He's from the 30s and the 40s. And he wrote five books, Up Your Sleeve, The Magicians Only, and a bunch of others, and they're great. Um, and all of his effects are original, which is unusual. And his, and his methods are amazing. And, and then what turned you on to him? How did you find that? How did you find that book? I found him because I'd read this trick uh, in Greater Magic where one silk penetrates through a handkerchief in the glass, put a handkerchief, drop the silk in, it kind of worms its way out through the center of the hanky. Mm -hmm. And I'd read that in Greater Magic by Charles Waller, and then I'd read it described somewhere else. And I was like, this is really clever. Who is this guy? And I looked him up. Um, and then in some of the old Davenport's catalogs as well, like his tricks, there's a, Thea has this trick of his where an orange visibly changes to a lemon. Hmm. And... And so I, um, I started like tracking down his old books. You can get most of them on PDF now. They've been digitized. Yeah. But uh, you read his book, just one of his books, and you get so excited about the effects and the methods. Like he's got a thing with a, an orange, a regular orange where um, a playing card appears sticking out of it, it's like visibly just impales in the orange. I mean, just uh, he has a trick where you fire, you spin a card in the air and it vanishes. Um, and then it appears in the middle of a frame across the stage, still spinning. You know, wow. like stuff like that, where it's kind of, he, he really was very clever. And so he had this double bowl production, uh, where you have a, a foulard and then you produce a bowl of flowers, then a bowl of water and then a bottle of beer for you. So the idea was, you know, flowers, water for the assistants and a bottle of beer for you. And it was all very self, not self-contained. It was like basically one load. And I expanded on it to be uh, a bowl of eggs, um, a bowl of flowers, and, and a, a bowl of water. So I wanted to do like a triple bowl production. And we had, um, and again, it's one load, which, which was great. 
So the night before the wedding, I got invited to the pre-wedding dinner, which was at a Chinese restaurant. And it was perfect because they kept going on about the Peking duck. And I was like, oh, 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 I know what I'm going to do. So I go out at the beginning of the show and I say, uh, I'm like, all right. So um, it was a great dinner last night, wasn't it? It wasn't at yeah, the, the Chinese restaurant. And I've got some memories that I acquired from the restaurant, the tablecloth, right? This is a tablecloth. And then I used a rubber dove for the old Peking duck joke. Did the steel when I threw the dove in the air. And then it was like a bowl of eggs from the kitchen because you can't use real animals anymore. You know, the centerpieces and uh, and the the um, bowls of sake. And oh, that my was, gosh. You know, and then that, it was just so. Fantastic. It was, it was nerve-wracking doing, yeah, doing like a new piece to begin with. But I'm glad it went on. Well, I, I admire you for doing that for uh, and doing something so complicated at a your first gig out for, what, 10 years or so. Yeah, I was, uh, it was interesting, but I did, again, my voice by the, I was about two thirds of the way through the show and I started getting hoarse, you know, and I oh. found that I was pushing. Yeah. So I was talking a little bit like this, which I didn't, because <laughs> I had a bloody mic, a mic right here. So it is, uh, that's probably the, the one thing to think about. Yeah, there. Tell me about this show you did. I never saw it. You did a one man show that you wrote. It was at a theater. Or did you do yeah. it? Uh, I mean, you did it in LA. Chipper Lowell helped you with it. He kind of helped. Direct Chipper it. directed it. Uh, Phil, Phil, uh, Chris Philpott uh, also helped me with some of the writing and some of the bits and pieces. And um, we, uh, did I, when I have uh, seen we, some of pieces of that show, when we worked together in Reno, you did this really interesting bit. I go, that feels very theatrical to me. Was did anything you did in bit, Reno? Were you, no, it was a so, period well, piece, yes, uh, no. like a... I did that piece of Why Mama Hates Magic, which was, uh, I'd actually, oh. that was that was a new bit that I was thinking of doing in for The Illusionists, and I put oh. that together for The Illusionists, and oh, that okay. was, the idea of that was, um, you know, like, as magicians, we love to have these story tricks, uh, but the story is always a bit lame, you know, it's always like, guy showed me a trick, and then I was like, oh, where can I buy that? You go, yeah. Oh, magic. <laughs> and, you, and you're like, for fuck's sake. But there's no... There's never any, um, I mean, that, that, that story-esque patter goes back to Oswald Williams doing the repeat handkerchief vanish. So for him, and for obviously six card repeat, and those, I don't, I'm not quite sure who overlaps who on that. I think Williams was first. But um, I'm like, there has to be, can't we have a better story? Yes. Can't the story have a twist in the tale, right? Thank you know, you. There's, right. there's that great, um, TV show in England that I've just been uh, shown called uh, Inside Number Nine, where it's these yes. very strange, right? Yeah, very strange yes. stories. And the, the, the magic one was clever. Yeah, it was really clever. And at the very end of it, there's always this twist that brings it all together. Yeah. And I thought there has to be. So my, my idea for that was to, I wanted to do the repeat handkerchief vanish sequence from Oswald Williams, but have a, have a twist in the tale at the end. And so yeah. that was why... You know, I presented it like we found Oswald Williams' original patter from the uh, nineteen. <laughs> That's what it was. That's right. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, and uh, I'm, gonna, and I've, I'm, go and I'm going to do it for you right now, exactly as he did it in 1925. And then my opening line is, hello, bitches. You know, yeah. And then we're off. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so the, the whole story is about why mama hates magic and and so that's the twist in the tale uh the the one man show was um more about uh uh just the what i had to deal with when i came to la and trying to juggle being an actor and a magician that's what that was all about and just oh, and it wow. was uh, it was the first time i'd done a full evening show we talk about jumping in the deep end almost everything was brand new when we opened uh, when there, there were no old routines except for a little bit of close-up in the middle of it and um and it was a uh, trial by fire. I mean, Chipper was amazing because he helped me stage it. And he basically taught me how to use a media star while I was on stage. Yeah, yeah. And, wow. you know, there were all these things I had to learn. Um, how and, important and is it to you? I mean, when you have a director, I don't care who it yeah. is, just that other person telling you when something was shit, you know, sitting there watching yeah. you going, don't do that. Don't walk over there. It's so it's important, important, right? Yeah, it's important. And, and there's... I mean, there's, I think it helps if they understand magic. And when, yeah. I, when I was touring um, with The Illusionists, we had a, a, a director who was touring with us who didn't know magic. Right. And so there was one point I'd looked back when I was doing the snowstorm and I was like, the camera's at a bit, a bit of a weird angle and you can flash the, yeah. the big ball, right? You know, the ball of the load. And, and, and I'd said to, I went up to the director afterwards and I was like, you know, 
I'm noticing that the cameraman is at a bad angle. And so, yeah, I've noticed that a couple of times. And I'm like, why did yeah, you say exactly, something? This yeah. is like, what? <laughs> like, if that, had been, if that had been Ginger, if Ginger had been on the tour, yeah, yeah, she would right. immediately would have been like, you know, you're right. flashing. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it's really important. I mean, there's something to be said for having someone who's just theatrically focused yeah. um, because they can also help you edit which i think as a magician is one of the hardest sometimes the magi- do, right? even another magician will let you have your head too much you know because they're a fan yeah yeah like my 72 phase ambitious card yeah can right cut down a little bit <laughs> and so um and so i think having a director is is incredibly important just how to walk on there was something yeah. that eric jones did recently that i thought was so lovely and that it feels like it was a piece that was directed in he had his video start at the beginning of his show and then the timing of as the video ended and he comes on but he doesn't come on from the side he comes from the back corner and kind of bananas in and there was just this kind of wave this energy as as he comes up right it was well timed it was well timed and it and it was just it was just this beautiful entrance and you know i always talk to appreciated that yeah i I do too it's transitions that's how i judge a show what happens in between the Mm. magic takes care of itself most of these routines come to us from the 30s from guys who've already figured out the narrative of the trick. They're done. The trick's That's done. True. Yeah. How do you get on stage? Did how do you get on stage? Shows a day, right? How exactly. do you get somebody yeah. up on stage? How do you transition to the next thing? That's where the art is. That's where showbiz is. That's the connecting tissue is where the fun, right. the potential. And, you know, in The Illusionist, I've told this story before, but it seemed to be that, so, uh, for example, Neil Darwood, one of the, you know, the main director for The Illusionist, he goes, okay, what trick are you going to do? I go, okay, I'm going to come right. out. He goes, what do you mean? Stop. What do you mean you're going to come out? From which direct, this stage is 50 feet long. How long is it going to take you to get to the middle? So we have to walk, watch right. you walk, uh, you know, and you're not a dancer or anything. You're plodging along like grandpa, walking out the, we got to watch that for four seconds. You know, we have a million dollars worth of tech professionals aiming spotlights and sound and background and dancers and all this stuff. And we get to watch you for six seconds, walk out there. No, we're going to find you. There. Okay. Brilliant. Then what? Well, then I get a guy up. Oh, now you get a punter up. Where's he? I don't know. So he could be in the middle of the crowd. I mean, what? And they, he brings all the team together. Okay. We got to figure out how we're going to start this and put all our minds to it, put all our technology. Put our, So in the end, it's like, okay, that act stopped. Lights go down. When the lights come up, boom, you find me in the middle of the crowd or not in the middle, at the bottom of the stairs with the punter yeah. already beside me, already shuffling cards. I already know his name. We don't waste time going, what's your name? Where are you from? Give him a round of applause. None of that. It's he's a, right. Bob's going to shuffle this deck of cards. Come on, Bob. Rock music as Bob tries to follow me up the stairs and we get on stage in a funny, entertaining way with music and stuff. Okay, give me those cards shuffled. Uh, Bob tells me he's a plumber. but And boom, we're into the trick in, in the first four seconds, you know. Isn't that fantastic? And I, I never would have thought that of that. We, and when I watch now also, a magic show, we go, I need a volunteer. Yeah. Okay, how about, no. You, uh, 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 and 45 seconds later, which is an eternity, they finally get to, what's your name? Give them a round of applause for doing nothing. You know, it's just tired part, and old. Part of that, though, is you've got the, like you say, you've got the, um, you're lucky enough to have a team. You're lucky enough well, to have a team. Well, that's it. That's what I'm saying. That blew me away with the illusionist was like three trucks of equipment and the entire crew and all that stuff working for yeah. you. And that, that's great. And we're so used to being like the solo, like you say, you've got the gig, you're going to show yeah. up, you're going to show up, you're going to do it. And so, we, but you can still take those elements, right? You can still take those ideas. Those say, lessons, those example, lessons that this is boring. Yeah, if, if I end a trick at some point on one side of the stage, I can run down the stairs right there and grab someone to bring them back. As While they're clapping. Ending that trick in the, exactly. Yeah. At the back of the stage. And now I've got to put the prop down, pick up the table. It's layering, this. isn't it? While you're on stage yeah. with Bob, you go, what's your name? Julie? Julie, what is it? Here, shuffle these. I'm going to get back to you later. Keep yeah. yourself busy. You're, look, you're looking at your phone too much. You know, it's a laugh. But also, we've introduced Julie. She's already shuffling the cards, so we don't have to waste our time later. So you're layering this whole show. This you know, is the, watch art, Darren, this is the art form of building the show, right? Yeah, when well, I what, watch Darren Brown. About as you're doing your, oh, yeah. It's, it's, oh, it's, there's, you know, I watch One Mentalist, and it's all, uh, as Chris Cox liked to call it, admin. There's just, do me a favor, hold this, take that, do this, do me a favor, do me a favor, do this, admin, but, 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 right. walk over here, do that. But for some reason, Darren... Just fill it. That's all invisible. He suppresses all the admin. Uh, it doesn't come to the front. His personality and wit come to the front, even though he's still doing all that stuff. And I don't know how he does it. It's seamless. Yeah. 
Copperfield transitions. Yeah. I watch that show. It's just the seamless transitions from one thing to interesting thing to the next. Don't want to give people a chance to to, to uh, uh, go to the bathroom. You want to you want to hold them the whole time. And, yeah. and so when I was doing the, um, you know, Paul Daniels talks about this a lot in the tapes that he did with Lewis. Uh, what was it called? The um, the Bravo. Is it Bravo? Bra- uh, Bravara. Bravo. Bravura. Bravura. Yeah. Bravura. He talks a lot about this kind of how to handle it. Is that right? And, and he, he, yeah, I mean, he, he was talking about the dividing the stage into segments, like what's the weakest area in a stage to stand, what's the strongest and, you know, how you, and Sammy Davis did this a lot in his live shows was there were times when you're, you know, you're in the, the, the front left side. Versus yes, so there's a cube on stage, center. isn't there? Like a big Rubik's cube. There's nine zones. And if you can, yeah. you can almost use all of them and up as well, standing on tables or chairs and getting down on the, yeah. sitting on the floor. And, yeah. So when I did cards to pocket, it was important to me because that was a feature in the, in the one man show. Cause the whole thing was kind of built around this idea that Dick Turpin, who was my old mentor had wanted me to do cards to pocket. And it was a trick that I never, the 10 cards to pocket. And it was always a bit really? complicated for a kid to learn. Yeah. So, um, I played around with it and kind of given up on it. And then, uh, years later in 2011, I was doing a movie in, um, in, in New Zealand and literally bump into a guy in a magic shop who was part of my magic club when I was a kid in England. He moved, moved to New Zealand and started a new life. And it was the craziest thing, Brian, Brian Oaks. And so he and I had dinner and I was, he didn't remember me, but I'm like, I know you, I know you. You <laughs> used to be a member of the South End Sorcerer Society. And uh, Brian had a video of all these old magicians that I remember when I was a kid who were part of the club, Jimmy Rogers, who used to be kind of like Will Goldston's right-hand man, who was a mentor of mine for a little bit. Um, wow. And and Dick Turpin doing Cards to Pocket. And so that kind of sent me back on the whole Cards to Pocket thing, which ended up becoming the C2P project, like that crazy Cards to Pocket seven DVD disc uh, teaching of mine. And, and so- Tell me about uh, that later. Keep the story going, momentum. But yeah, I want to go yeah. back to so that. Anyway, so at the end of the Cards to Pocket, I'm realizing that, you know, where I was on stage, it was fine. But if I want to do it in cabaret, if I want to do it um, on a dance floor, you know, people have to be able to see it. So I got like a big, a big step. And so it's really nice. That even when I'm on stage now, I'll jump up onto this big step to emphasize the pocket. Fantastic. And, and we get that height change. You get the, yeah. that thing where you're standing and it makes yeah. it like a pulpit really in a way, you sure. know, and you're there yeah, of kind course. of doing it. So I, Sammy Davis would do that. He'd go up, he'd go down. He would sit on the edge of the stage. You know, the whole, the whole thing. I would do the whole thing. I learned. I studied Sammy Davis for the one man show because there's a live concert of his in Australia, and he does everything. There's, he uses the, the he uses the elements of the stage, how he comes on, how he takes a moment, how he sits. I loved him. On the, on the I loved him. There's the a stage. I'll go back and yeah. watch. He did a German television, a live concert on German television that I keep watching mm. over and over again. It's great. It's yeah. fantastic, and, and isn't it? The, yeah, they're laughing at his jokes. He's not trying to yeah. talk in the uh, gym. And he does that, but it's that whole, it's the deconstruction of, which is something I really did when I came, when I start the show, I'm very done up. I've also <coughs> got like a, like a ton of pulls and, and gadgets on me at the beginning <laughs> of the show. So I'm like this. And then at about 10 to 15 minutes in, all that stuff is gone. And I actually physically start to relax more. The audience starts to relax more. And then the jacket comes off and then the shirt comes off and then I'm in a t-shirt and my pants and, and, uh, and the, and, and Sammy was the same thing. You loosen the tie, you know, yeah, the yeah, old yeah. cabaret thing where they would have the bow tie hanging sure, down. Like sure. yeah, yeah. He's working his ass off for you. Right. Yeah, yeah. That was always the, that yeah. was always the, I always love was like, this guy is on stage. He's not phoning it. And look how, look at the end of it. He's just, he's dripping. He's, and yeah. I love that idea of, I hate watching somebody walk through a show. I'm like, I want to see you just fucking try. You know, yeah, this is yeah. this is the most important show in your life. Make it work. And yeah. that's that was what I used for the for the show. And okay. and I had a I had a blast doing it. With the original show was two acts. It was two and a half hours long, which was insane. Wow. Um, and then and then I did a, a ninety minute version of Black Rabbit Rose in Hollywood for a while. And did then, you? Uh, oh wow! Yeah, yeah. We used to, but we it was working for nightclub people is a very interesting it's experience. A whole, yeah, it's, it's a, a different thing. It's yeah. a whole, it's a whole different world. And the hip, uh, Hollywood and, hipsters. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we did it on a Sunday. The idea was to do it on a Sunday, which really wasn't a popular night for people to go out. And so there was always kind of, it was struggling to yeah. to kind of fill it. Uh, and then I did the 42 minute version of the castle and the palace, which was interesting because that was a lesson in editing because I had to edit down to what, the core of what the show was about. And, right, which right. Was, actually really fun to would do. you ever bring it back um, or you ever thought of doing it in toronto or uh... yeah i was going to do i was going to do a 90 minute version in toronto right before the pandemic we we're oh. working on it um my plan is to film it just film it as a you know as a live magic special kind oh, of thing nice. and then oh, you know, do something cool? with it um, yeah and now all these years later i mean i did that in 2015 